the two biodiversities uh, here on the Pacific campus and, and the woods. And so we're grateful for everyone coming. We're also grateful to have our in the library. And so we want to first do a little bit of overall framing of the day. Then we're going to turn to Carla to talk about some of the resources of the library. Then we're going to have a chance to learn from some of the educators at the two five centers, including some video, um, to show us what this looks like in practice. And then we're going to get into small groups. And so you have some index cards that have been passed out. And in part, that if as things are going on and have questions that arise, feel free to jot it down and we'll be able to discuss that in small groups as well as give you a chance in small groups to actually do some, some role playing, talking about how you might apply this yourself. So that's our ultimate goal we're going to get to by the end of today. And we'll come back together. This is a continuation of some work we've been doing for a year now um, to help really think about how do we do this work around raising children in an era in which we know that race still matters, but of course we're doing that in a place in which there's not necessarily a lot of diversity. And um, so I'm really grateful to be doing this work with these different colleagues. Um, and, and just wanted to briefly say, one of the, the first, um, actually things I did when I was in graduate school was trying to think about how do we teach kids about diversity in different kinds of schools. And I worked with some really great psychologists who were looking at racial biases, and they talked about the different ways in which this is such a critical age to um, affect whether and how children develop their, their noticing of difference, which begins as early as six months of age, and how to potentially prevent the formation of things like racial bias. And so one of the, the lessons that I, I still take from that work is this um, intervention that um, some psychologists did looking at using stories about Jackie Robinson, which is my four-year-old's favorite person. Um, and, and this example used three different ways of teaching about it. One was you just talked about Jackie Robinson was this great baseball player, and he won an MVP award, and once he retired, he worked for the peanut company. Uh, and so you can learn about him as a good person. The second one talks about the fact, oh, by the way, Jackie Robinson happens to be black. And the third one, which was an anti-racism one, was actually focused on talking about the discrimination and racism that we face. And they found that there were very different kinds of outcomes for children based on whether they were a labeling race or not, and B, whether they were actually talking about the way in which you had to think about racism. And so that, for me, is a really important way for us to think, even when we have books, for example, that may um, help portray stories. It's also about how we're using the books. And so both, we're both trying to get at how do you choose books to help engage in these conversations, as well as how you use those books. And we can also get into other questions as well. We certainly some of the stuff that we need to think about too as parents is how do we learn more about this ourselves in order to then be able to translate it for younger kids. And so those are lots of different questions we hope to get to today. Um, <coughs> I'm going to turn it over to Holly next. Holly Rutherford, the Director of Child Care Services here at Penn State. Um, and we're going to talk about more that stuff and more on the class. Thank you, Erica. Um, so a lot of you in this room, this is going to be a repeat. Um, we actually, back in, I think it was the summer of 2016, um, when we were bringing Port Woods in house to be managed by Penn State, um, realized an opportunity for training for our educators around diversity and inclusion. Um, that fall, um, the university announced its all-in initiative, which actually also helped to support us in, in the initiative as an institutional goal. And we've really spent a lot of time um, in training through our year, I guess almost two years now. We did a 15-hour training series on cultural competency um, with affirmative action. And really the baseline for that was just to become a little bit more sensitive and understanding our own biases. We looked at implicit bias um, and just various ways we feel and think based on our own personal stories. So we did that for the first year. Um, we also did a lot of work uh, with Erica and her center and also with Andrew Grant Thomas, who is the co-founder of Embrace race and we did trainings um, where educators were invited and also parents and a lot of parents participated in those events as well. We started our grad lab lectures that year as well um, around anti-racist, uh, raising anti-racist children. So this is a continuation of that. 
Um, and then this year we're doing a lot of work um, really with implementation of some of the things that we learned last year. So our goal, um, each staff actually has a goal related to diversity and inclusion. Um, this year is more about implementing practice. So some of the things we've been learning, we also are doing a book study um, at Hortwoods on anti-bias curriculum um, with Louise Derman Sparks and Julie Olson Edwards, who are awesome and know a lot about this work with young children. Um, and then at Bennett, they're studying the teaching tolerance curriculum, um, which is another whole framework for understanding how to support children in anti-bias education. Um, so we've come a long way. We're doing a lot. Um, sometimes I think we forget we've done so much. Um, so we're really excited about the continuation of this. Also in the spring, um, we have invited Katie uh, Kissinger, who is a leading expert in anti-bias curriculum education. She's also the author of some books that um, and our educators understand and know our reading to the children. So she'll be coming, um, actually I want to save the date for those of you who are in this room who may be parents or educators. So January 30th, um, she's going to be doing a Lunch and Learn with us uh, from 12.30 to 2. And she's going to be talking about anti-bias education. So she's here that day anyway. She's going to be at Fort Woods and Bennett doing some classroom visits. And then that's actually that evening she's doing an entire leadership retreat um, with all of our directors and assistant directors from all of the Penn State centers from across the university. We have eight child care centers um, throughout the state. So we're excited about that. And then she's coming back on March 6th. I think that's the date, right? Um, and she's yes. doing, I'm looking at Misty. <laughs> um, and she's going to do a full, like, a full <coughs> training with the staff for four hours on anti-bias education and approaches and how to implement those into training. So we're really excited about that. Um, and the continuation of this, and I think today we wanted to focus on children's literature because um, as a teacher, being a teacher in a classroom um, and not knowing or feeling really super confident in certain topics, literature and books have always been a great way to kind of bring up ideas um, that maybe you don't know a lot about or of interest. Um, and over the last decade, as I've worked with educators, I always kind of remind them the importance of bringing in books. How do you even decide what you bring into your classroom? Because um, a lot of times, some of these books have ideas and misrepresentation, um, and sometimes you don't realize it until like mid book with a child. You're like, oh my god, I probably shouldn't start reading a book. And so, and I've been there. Um, and so I think it, it's an opportunity to think through your own practices about what books you bring into your, the lives of your own children um, and into the, the classroom. Um, so we're excited about that um, and continue the journey. So. Absolutely. And I'm Allison Edward. Um, I really <coughs> and we just wanted to thank you all for coming. I was reminded this morning, I was having a, a conversation with a colleague, and she was so amazed. And I was explaining what we were doing today, and she was so amazed. She was like, oh, awesome. The teachers are doing that, and they're taking that initiative. So we just wanted to thank you for being here being on your lunch hour, taking your time, and um, preparing to be comfortable sometimes, uncomfortable sometimes, and courageous all the time. We wanted to make our educators feel comfortable in doing this work as well, which is why we developed a commitment to diversity statement, and that's actually in our plans, but also for parents as well to understand the importance of this work, uh, and to feel comfortable uh, teaching with a social justice lens. Um, I observed the coolest study or lesson in Jen's room, which she's going to share some videos from that she's done with the children, but I'm just feeling comfortable to do that. Um, I feel supported in, in this work. It's really exciting. So. And this is my next group of diversity oh, statements. Um, here, if anyone mm -hmm. has a question, or if this is, I think we have some hard copies in the back as well. This is um, part of our larger, in addition to doing some practice, we really see today as a way to provide resources. And so, um, one of the things that I just shared at the beginning was this web page we have on our, our website, which is Resources for working with, it's a pre K, it can also be toddlers in terms of working around diversity. And so um, feel free to browse this at your leisure in terms of different resources, both from the work that we've done, has some, some of the brown bag presentation, but also other links as well. Uh, and then we also see bringing in Carlisle Schmidt from the libraries as a really wonderful resource. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to see the children's literature library that we have over in Pate on the fifth floor, is that right? Turner on the fifth floor. Sorry, I, I've been here for seven years, I'm still can't get this great. <laughs> it's still left in the Um <laughs> But it is, it is just a remarkable resource for us. It is one of my family's favorite spring break jobs to go to because we get books, they have all kinds of games and other resources. It is really a treasure that we have here at Penn State, and just right across the street. And so um, we are, are grateful to have a friend joining us and to tell us a little bit about um, about the work. Um, 
Um, I wanted to mention that I passed out this year's A Baker's Dozen bookmark to all of you in the 2017 list. We named 15 best books for family literacy every single year, and we print these bookmarks and we send them out free of charge to anyone who wants them. So if you have a family evening and you'd like to have these books or do activities around these books, I'll show you this on our website that um, we have all kinds of activities to do with children and then activities also to do with adults to teach them how to use the books with kids. So family literacy involves also adult education and making sure that adults um, know the importance of early emergent literacy and what to look for in the literature. And I brought past years that I put on that card over there. I didn't know if you want all, you know, some of those past years, but if you're interested, um, take those. And then I also, I put my email address up here, kms454 at ksu.edu. Um, so if you have any questions later or you'd like, you know, anytime you can think of me as your personal librarian, I guess at the library. Emily Rimland is here too, and she's a librarian over at um, Paternal Library as well. And, you know, either of us would be happy to answer any questions that you might have about our collection or how to find things. Um, it's hard to see, but the, the um, Areas that I wanted to cover today, and I don't have very long, so I told Erica she'll have to cut me off. <laughs> I think I need about 20 minutes, so I'll go a little bit fast. But I want to talk about the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, which um, is an affiliate of the Center for the Book at the Library of Congress. And if you're a librarian like I am, it's like, woo, big time, big deal, because the Library of Congress is the largest library in the whole world, and to have that connection with them is pretty amazing and really awesome. And they support all of the literacy and literature initiatives that we do. So that's, that's kind of exciting. It gives us a real national presence. And then I wanted to talk about a database that we have called the CLCD. It used to be called the Children's Literature Comprehensive Database, but the person who purchased it changed the name to the acronym. So CLCD, it's on our A to Z database list. And it has reviews of children's books that I think are amazing and wonderful and it really the books will in those reviews will talk about bias it'll talk about um, um, maybe if there's something about the book that um, they don't think is appropriate or if there's some aspect maybe the illustrations are horrible or something who knows or the illustrations don't enrich the story in some way so those reviews can be extremely helpful and then um, the ALA book and media awards that's the American Library Association they have a number of awards that are um, targeted, like the Pura Valpre Award is given to Latina authors, Latino authors and illustrators, and uh, the Coretta Scott King is given to African American authors and illustrators, and those are all great places to go to look for some of the best literature that's out there. So just to kind of show you how to get to that spot. And then um, I always think of our public libraries being one of the best in the whole area. Sklo is amazing, and they have all kinds of toys and educational materials um, besides books as we do. We have a room called the Kit Room and we have all kinds of materials there that you are welcome to check out. You know the parachute for gym class? You can check that out at our library. Um, we have a talking cash register. We have um, bugs in acrylic that are really cool to look at under a microscope. So really a huge variety, lots of books and puppets and um, our teacher education students use this collection all the time, and the community is very welcome to use it as well. So I hope you take advantage, and if you have any questions about any of those things, please let me know. So Erica is going to help drive the computer because I'm not a Mac user, and I was already seeing that I was going to fumble a little bit if I <laughs> were the person driving things. So this is our Pennsylvania Center for the Book website, and if you could go under Awards and Contests, and then go to a Baker's Dozen, and then click on that. These are all the contests that we have. And the introduction to the Baker's Dozen, um, 13 best books, and they fulfill the goals of family literacy programs across the nation to create lifelong readers and lovers of books. And start with the youngest audience. So we're really targeting three to six year olds. But I think a number of these books are great read alouds also up to about second grade. So this is what we're looking for when we're selecting these books. Last year we had 800 books in hand. Probably we looked at about 1,200 reviews to decide on which books we look at. So I read lots of reviews. I have an assistant who helps with that. We, our committee um, has an uh, early childhood specialist. We have a woman who worked with preschool children who've had, who had disabilities um, and special needs. We have um, a number of children's lit experts. We have grandparents on our committee. So we feel like we have a really nice 
committee group, we are going to we are looking for nominations for a committee member of color because we really feel that that will um, help our list to become more diverse than it is. So I did bring some titles here um, that are on past lists that I consider to be ones that um, really show representation of many different cultures and um, I think they're some of these are really excellent titles but it's very difficult to find books that include diversity and um, have no bias for especially the younger children. We see more books available for older kids in those areas than we do for the really young ones. So our, our criteria, we're looking for outstanding trade books whose text and illustrations are particularly suited to the ages and developmental characteristics of children between the ages of three and six. We look at both fiction and nonfiction. We want books that are accessible to adults enrolled in family literacy programs. So what we mean by that is that we really want folks who maybe aren't readers themselves or don't understand the importance of reading to their children. Um, we want books that are really accessible to them, that have, uh, it goes on and on, text that is very easily approachable. So not a lot of words and phrases on our page. I love that for our 25th year, the very first year, the award was won by Ashley Bryan, very famous author, illustrator. Um, Sing to the Sun is the book that won, and the illustrations are amazing. I don't know if you've ever heard Ashley speak or story tell. He came for our, I think it was our 21st year of the Hopkins Award. He's 93 now, 93 and in failing health, but um, still one of the best storytellers I've ever met, and this book is just absolutely gorgeous. And then this year's book is by Jorge Argueta, and it's We Are Like the Clouds, and it's the very first time for this award that we've ever chosen a bilingual book. And um, it's about children and immigration, and it is absolutely beautiful. Oops, I don't know, we got little color-coded stuff in our books. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and some of these, some of our poetry books can be used with very young children. Most of them, though, are books like Diamond Willow, which we're seeing more novels in verse. But this is about a little Athabascan um, child, a little girl who lives in Alaska, and um, something horrific happens in this story and how she deals with that. But it's, it's just a fabulous book. And there is great diversity among all the titles that have been chosen. And when you think that that committee has changed every single year for 25 years, it's really wonderful. Um, as you Clay is about, I don't know if you've heard of Dave the Enslaved Potter, written by Andrea Chang. It's another novel in verse, but it's um, nonfiction and it's a fabulous story. This I saw on Antiques Roadshow, I don't know if it was last month, but one of Dave the Potter's pots. You know, he was, he was, I forget who owned him and the whole story, but he wrote poetry on these pots. It sold for like, or they said it was like over half a million dollars. So, wow, <laughs> amazing, because they've lasted all that time. Um, so we have a lot of wonderful titles on our event office poetry award list as well. And something that's exciting, I don't know if everybody knows this, but Lee Hopkins, um, is setting us oops, oops, his whole entire collection. So he, is, he thinks he has the second largest collection of poetry books behind the Library of Congress. And we're getting all of them, 18,000 titles. Um, and then he's also sending us all of his manuscripts. And I know that it's just going to be a rich collection of titles that we're going to be getting. And those manuscripts will bring a lot of scholars to Penn State. Um, he wrote two books about children's authors and illustrators and um, you know, their stories in their lives many times are wonderful uh, stories to share with children. So we're very excited about that. The collection has been valued at $3.25 million, and um, that it's, it's a, like a wonderful windfall for us because we know we're gonna be getting a lot of lot more diverse titles from Lee. And also, um, he's decided to give us a million dollars in addition to make sure that the award continues into perpetuity. So, very exciting times at the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. We're super excited about that. 
And um, I, I feel like I've become the director at this really exciting time when all of these things are happening. So we're hopefully continuing with all of these literacy initiatives that have started many years ago now and are continuing and hopefully they'll continue for a long, long time to come. I was looking over the, um, the article that um, was passed out and I would have to say that these are conversations that our committees have about many of the titles. Um, so very important and I think these are conversations that you're easily able to bring um, to discussions with children in particular. I think uh, Carlos, uh, uh, referring to the uh, um, the handout, the two-page handout on uh, looking at uh, gender bias. So this is a great framework, and this is specifically looking at gender bias. But the reason why I brought this and I chose this is that some of the things that it's talking about we can use in terms of anti-racist, you know, gender bias, and really any type of anti-bias approaches. So looking at issues of of representation. Uh, tokenism. These are things that, while explicitly being talked about in terms of gender, can really be used in a lot of anti-bias approaches. Every year with the Baker's Dozen, we see certain trends. It seems there's certain types of books that are coming out. Like one year, Ninja Baby, Ninja Child, Ninja Ninja Ninja. It was all Ninja everything. And another year, it seemed like it was all sibling books. Lots of sibling books. So there seems to be trends in what the publishers are publishing. And this year, we've noticed a trend that we really like. In the past, we've seen fathers depicted in sort of the brunt of the joke in books, but we've seen excellent fathers depicted and the role of the father and how the father talks to the child. Just some really wonderful books that have come out. And I have a feeling some of those will make the list because they, they do depict that the father role so much better than what we've seen in the past. And then um, the next, I don't know how much time I have, but. Probably another minute or two. Okay, so let's quickly go to the, pens the library's homepage. So P just PSU libraries, and all of these, if you Google them, they'll pop right up. So I didn't bring any websites or anything. Seems like it's easier to just type in the words, but you need. And then go to databases. Click on the C and go to Children's Literature, CLCD. Children's Literature Comprehensive Database. It may take a while for this to come up. Um, this is something that any of the teacher ed students, um, many of them use this in their children's lit classes to look for reviews of titles. Is it available to go outside of the as well? <coughs> Meaning the, the, um, the information or the database has to be There are parts of this website that are free, yes. So, but the database itself, that I'm not so positive about. You may have to be on campus to use it if you're not a Penn State faculty, staff, or a student. And um, CLCD will give, a, by students signing up, they get a subscription to this database for one year for free after they graduate. So it's really you know, wonderful if your school district doesn't have this database. I use this all the time. We look at reviews before we put any books in the collection, and sometimes we put in books that have gotten not such great reviews, um, because that's a, something that we can use in a teaching situation. Now it's gonna take it a while, but I feel like you can find almost every title, every author, every illustrator, every time at this site. And it includes video clips of authors, and um, if you know diverse authors, you can look them up at this site and find what their latest titles are. And I think that's a great big help. And you can see you can limit according to reader and age. You can um, limit by award or genre. And then we go up to um, Read and Shine. This is the part that's free and available to the public without a subscription. <coughs> and you can see they have all these different awards, thematic lists, you can scroll down. You can see this you know, information about the call to have the best pictures, famous women, challenge books, and so on. So there's a great list, and then here's where those author interviews are, and all kinds of reading lists. This is an incredible resource. 
And then there are many featured articles. If you go to featured articles, I think the featured article talks about reading aloud to children. Things like that. I know there's a great big article out there. It popped up for me right away when I was looking at it again. So, and you can see that, um, you know, the article pink is for girls, blue is for boys. I'm sure there's some good information in that article. This is also about um, a, a, a discussion that started last year around trying to challenge um, the black in particular make sure they have more right Yes. 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 When you said that, I mean, you think, uh, this book is, is about an animal. A lot of books for really young children include an animal or animal objects or robots, that kind of thing. Um, but this is a graphic novel for the very young. And that, you know, graphic novels are a huge trend with teens in particular right now. Um, the whole comic world is crazy, but this company, it's called um, Toon Books, actually published books for preschoolers. And we, we were impressed by the simplicity and yet the, the message of this book, I guess, the content. So that was pretty unusual for us to put a graphic novel on our list. And then, um, quickly, could you go to the International Children's Digital Library? This is an online resource that includes full text of children's books from many different countries. And you can limit according to age. You can limit according to the language or country that you're interested in. Um, so where it says, um, go to read books right there under the library. And this, this fact just keeps improving all the time. It was a little clunky at first, but it, it does seem to get better all the time. But here's where it's the three to five, six to nine, it's 10 to 13. And then, um, I don't know, why don't we try the adventure of uh, You know, I, I really think this is a, you know, for a learning center in a school situation or working with children to learn languages other than English. Or, or just even to see uh, visual representations and depictions of various cultures. There's a lot of good stuff here. So I wanted you just to be aware of that. And then the ALA website, I know I'm taking up more time than I should, but I'll just show you really quickly how to get to those awards. So this is a list. Um, the other, I clicked on the side, which they both show the same thing, but the very description of what the award is for. So like, for example, the Curtis Scott King Award um, is given to an African-American author or illustrator for the best work of that year. Um, <clears throat> I really want to point out notable. The notable, notable children's books include all of the awards given, plus other books that librarians think are exceptional for children. Whenever I've been asked to do a consultation for a library to check on their collection and see does it have everything that it should be, I always check the notable list. Every library should have a notable list. It's just one of the best. It's chosen by professionals in the field. And um, the Schneider Family Awards are given to awards that depict disabilities. And um, there's been some amazing titles on that list these last few years, just really exceptional. So we're seeing some awesome writing. Um, there are areas though that, that have holes, and I would say in particular, you know, for the really younger children, um, we still have a lot of work to do, publishers do. And that's part of where, you know, a lot of um, famous people <laughs> are getting books published because of their name, rather than because of the wonderful content that they're creating. And so, you know, sometimes when we look at those many titles that we're looking at for the Baker's Dozen, we wonder how in the world did this horrible book get published in the first place? How in the world did any editor think that this was good? So, um, you know, there's still work to be done, and I don't know what the answer to that is always, except that we need to keep being diligent and look out there for the best titles that we can find. And use, um, folks, you know, librarians, we're here to assist people, and I think the librarians at Slow are really exceptional as well.
And if you're looking for anything, I know they'd be more than willing to help. <clears throat> and teachers. <laughs> teachers have some of the best expertise there is. So take advantage of, for any of you that are parents, titles that are um, promoted by educators. So I'll stop there. So thank that, you. Thank and you. we may come back with questions at the end um, sure. for the part of the world when we're in small groups. Well, and I really, um, Kelly, thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate the, um, just for me, I mean, looking at all the book lists, and, and I always love knowing about new books. One of the things that I think is really important when talking with young children about issues of bias and racism is to also differentiate that the way that I think about it is there's a couple different ways of going about it. So we're talking about ideas of representation. So like I brought some of my own books about like wonderful ideas about representation, like Grandma Cosme Beautiful, and this is set in Hawaii. I have you know our classic Ezra Jack Peake computer's chair. And then um, I love Tomas in the library. So this um, with uh, my own family. So these can be representations of just that these children, these families need to be in the classrooms. But then I think there's also books that, that um, we, and I think this is kind of a segue that Jen's talking about, about explicitly challenging biases. So some of my favorite, I use, you know, the skin I am, the skin I, I'm in, which is the first look at racism. So I can read you the first uh, page, you know, where it says, you know, imagine a world where only people with blue eyes could go to school, or a world where only people with brown eyes could get a job. So it explicitly looks at issues of power, justice, and, race, and racism. And then for a little bit older, but I use this with my undergraduate, and this is for um, indigenous families, particularly families that were um, forced to go to boarding schools, which is the history of the US, and so also looks at issues of racism and power and injustice of what happens. So these are both things that can be talked about and should be talked about with kids, but there's really two, to, and I think that both need to be in classrooms. But I do want you guys to think about the differences between the two. One of the challenges in doing this work that we've confronted is um, this challenge is trying to find appropriate resources for the infant to our age. And so Erin's going to share a book that she's used with the infant to age group to try to talk about these same type of things. So obviously with infant toddlers, the language is completely different. <laughs> you can't have the discussions. They probably won't bring up lower history mm -hmm. or like But um, the language is similar. The, the ideas kind of need to be put more in in some ways the same way of putting it in terms of their own world. Our young children, even some of our older children, are very egocentric. It needs to make sense and pertain to them directly. It needs to be relatable to them, which is why the representation and seeing themselves in books is so important. We see so many kids that can look at a book and say, that looks like me one or two years old, they're picking up on that, oh, that looks like my mom, that looks like my dad, that looks like so and so. They're making those connections. And it's generally based on the race of the person they're seeing in a book. So this one is from my son's collection. He very graciously let me borrow it, but we also have them at our center. It's a series. And this one is called You Are Beautiful. And so every page says, you are beautiful in many ways. And then each page is, you are beautiful when you wake up. And it's got families and children doing all kinds of different things. When you dress yourself, how you want to dress. It's empowering them to make those decisions for themselves. When you do your hair just the way you like it, you are beautiful. And it's just the repetitiveness of saying, you are beautiful. But it's showing all these different children, different families that look different. They might look like their own family, they might look like another person in their class's family, but it's exposing them to something that may not be their own world, but connecting it in the sense of you are beautiful. No matter what you look like, no matter what you're doing, there's <laughs> my favorite. Because I'm sure as parents, those of us that have kids in the room, we've seen our child like this. And it's saying, you are beautiful. And it's having those conversations. And by the end, I sat in on a couple classes that read this book that maybe they haven't, the kids haven't heard it as much. There was another book called I Like Myself that the kids have heard a lot. But I wanted something fresh that maybe they haven't heard as much. And by the end, the kids are saying, I'm beautiful when I, and 
It's awesome. Um, so for me, this one is just, it's the exposure, it's the repetitiveness of the words so that they're picking up on, these people might not look like me, but they're beautiful. So for me, I think this one, there's a whole bunch of other ones. There's you are important, you are friendly, and they all have great representation of other races and showing kids in different situations doing crazy things like being able to pull with their dog and <laughs> stuff like that. So, but it's an empowering message, and I think the younger kids walk away from that with a sense of power over you know their importance in the world, that they're seeing themselves, but also seeing others and making that connection with what we still have this in common. So, yeah. yeah. I like how those two books um, unknowingly are speaking to very much the same themes, but just in different ways for different age groups. Yeah. And as I've, so, <laughs> I've been going through our center's library it's a really big task. <laughs> um, so it's it's cool though because I've been able to sit down and look at all of these books that we have and really seeing how much you know white children are represented in these books and you know as a child growing up you know in a white family you know middle class I didn't ever see that and so thinking back. I'm like, you know, when I read a book, I wanted it to be shown something different than what I already knew. And I think it's our job to show that to even these younger ones, too. So. I, I, just one last point related to what Peter was just saying. We've talked um, in some of our, our discussions about how um, issues of both representation, but also around issues around justice, around race, or other types of diversity, um, matter for white children as well as for student children of color in different ways, but they're both really important. And so we, we're not just doing this to make sure that children of color see themselves in these books, although that is important. It's important for us to not center our whiteness as, as the only type of, of characters in these books. And so I think books like that are really helpful for doing that. So thanks for bringing up that point. Absolutely, to echo that, we've talked about this in the last, that oftentimes that um, families of color are the ones that are doing heavy lifting for this, and so it's even more important that we have families, white families, teachers that are white, that are doing this as well. So now we're going to turn to Jen Stoner from Bennett to talk about a book that she's used with some of the children. So, um, ours started off a little bit differently, like very intentional work here, whereas um, what happened in our classroom is a little bit different. We've been reading um, about Henry Matisse and we've read the book King of Color, and it's about him being nursed um, uh, back to health and you know doing something kind then back for um, the nurse that helped him out. But one of the things that the children noticed right away while we're reading it is that um, it talks about him being sick and him being in bed, um, but he didn't stop his work. He continued um, drawing um, and he continues going then on it and you see him in a wheelchair. Um, so that kind of sparked a conversation I heard amongst the children of, oh, he's old, that's why he's in a wheelchair. So I scrambled really <laughs> quick for the afternoon, and I found that some kids use wheelchairs, and it and it just and it's all about kids in wheelchairs. So it's not you're not in a wheelchair because you're old and sick. If anybody could potentially be in a wheelchair, um, and it takes you through um, the children's you know about why people are in wheelchairs. You know, it might not be that you're sick; it might be something else. Um, but it also shows kids in school, um, in everyday lives, um, uh, like swimming. You know, they can be out of their wheelchairs to go swimming. Um, going to school, um, how would you get into your vehicle? So ramps became then a big thing, and we started designing 
buildings that were successful for everyone. And we talked about when we walk around campus, sometimes we take a different route because there are 17 of us and it's a signature walk. And you know, somebody finally said, well, how do they go upstairs at night if they're in a wheelchair? So that sparked on another conversation of not all houses have two floors. Um, you know, some, some houses are all one floor. Some houses do have a little chimney heating and you want to get up to the top of the steps. So then they started, you know, looking at things differently in their own environment, not just so um, old sick people in chairs. And it's kind of taken on a bit of life of its own. You got scooters out and put things up high, have them try to scoot around. If you can't get out of the chair, you'll get that, you know, putting them into the position of being in that um, spot. Um, and it's taken on a little bit of life of its own. We started talking about another artist who had um, polio as a child and one leg shorter than the other. Tomorrow we're going to be taking blocks to one foot to see how they get around during the day and things like that. So it kind of, um, you put them into the situation too, not just always just a conversation about it, but you know. And that's kind of how ours just kind of organically took, took light into our classroom as opposed to, I was not really pointing it out in the book, but that's what they caught on to. So as teachers taking those moments to remember that's just as important as the lesson plan that you taught me have been really great, but they didn't see to being that, that flexible side of things. You know, sometimes it's just that one statement, comment that you hear off to the side can spark a whole other curriculum that we can do not That's kind of where we're at. Yeah, no, I think that's great, and it also speaks to the importance of us not being afraid to step into those moments which children offer us all the time, um, and we can certainly also do that in a lot of different ways, um, and so I think that's a great example to share with us. Oh, <laughs> and I talked about. We talked about lots of different, <laughs> lots of different options. Um, part of it was, uh, you know, just choosing books that had good pictures and, and being able to use it in different ways. And this one's about emotional, or being your feelings and being what to do with your emotions, but we, you know, it could branch into lots of conversations um, just because that provides great photos. Uh, we also talked about uh, eyes by my little eye and maybe one little part of somebody is made up of who they completely are, so we talked about that and how we could extend that um, to different we talked about the Oliver Button Mississippi book um, some and how you know some people might be really comfortable bringing that in um, with their children or into a classroom or something and some people might not be. Uh, but you know, really kind of having that open line of communication and um, if you feel comfortable with it or not. And uh, yeah, one of the books on Oliver Button is Tommy Day Total and it's about gender identities and gender expression. So um, yeah, and it, it uh, you know, and we've kind of talked about that in the past, and, but yeah, the, the courage to, to bring this up and to bring uh, uh, anti bias approaches for the children. So, Kim, uh, there's a picture of a, a homeless person in this book. I saw it as an opportunity to talk about that um, because where we live, we might not see as much yes. homelessness. Um, we were talking also about like transformational moments in our own like upbringing. Um, Katie has to do this work with us, is going to have us think through like the first moment in our lives as children we remembered what difference was. And mine was homelessness in London as a child. And I was like, why? Well, how could they as a child not have a home? And I remember being really concerned about that. And so we were even just talking about how to talk to children about it. Like there are homeless people in state college. And yes, we actually have a homeless shelter here. And so how would you talk to those children about that and bring that forward into the Right, and I think that that's another example of if we don't do that work, that those thoughts are still happening, and they may be happening in ways that don't want to apply. So the importance of, you know, kind of coming through and addressing these things, even though, you know, ooh, I don't know how to work on that. I'm reminded of a, um, of a discussion I had with, um, there were third graders at the time, um, and this is when I was in and there's many, many families that are parents of housing homeless people who cost a living. 
and the children were saying, oh, well, oh, there's so many families that are, they don't have houses because, um, because they didn't move back. And so I had eight-year-olds that were saying, oh, these people didn't move back. And so I thought, if we don't have these conversations, these ideas are still getting constructed as far as that, with a powerful reminder. I think also, too, speaks to the importance of doing work with adults ourselves to be prepared for these conversations, to be able to respond, um, to know about the homeless shelter here in State College, to be able to bring that in. So a lot of this, too, is to continue doing this work, both individually and collectively. And so that's why we thank you for being part of this. A uh, last story I have, I'm happy to share with others if you want, but I, I saw on social media earlier this week a, a group of, of parents in St. Louis, Missouri, are actually, there's, there's now hundreds of families from across, I think, like 67 different zip codes that are coming together, predominantly white families, to try to read books around diversity because they feel like they need to be doing this work and they, they thought it was stronger in community. And so sharing resources, but also having discussions together with their kids. And so it was a really wonderful way to think about ways that families can augment the work that are being done in preschool centers to help um, continue these discussions.